We have never had a dog that smoked in bed and set fire the blankets. We never had a dog that stole our towels and played the TV too loud. We have never had a dog in a fight with his traveling companions. We never had a dog that got drunk or broke the furniture. So, if your dog can vouch for you, you're welcome. <laughs> Sign on an industrial machine. If you've worked in a factory, you can understand this one. This machine does not know the difference between metal and flesh, nor does it care. I've known some guys that lost their fingers in those machines. A sign outside of business. Remember what valet parked your car, what he looks like, because we don't have valets. <laughs> a sign outside a Comfort Inn motel. Now pet friendly, except for bears. <laughs> We're not making that mistake again. A sign on the side of a public fish aquarium. Now, the, uh, the, there's a picture on top of the sign that's a club sandwich, the bread and layers of meat and cheese and all the fixings. And underneath that sign, it says, this is how our turtles and fish view your fingers. A sign on a medical office, and I had to look this one up, and I hope I can say the, the drug right. If you use methamphetamines, I got it. That is crystal meth, crank, speed, glass, tweak, or yaba. If you use those within 12 hours of dental appointment, you need to tell us because the dental anesthetic will kill you. A sign on a broken escalator. This escalator is refusing to escalate. This has been escalated to our engineer who is on his way up or down to check it out. A hazard sign on a country dirt road. If you've ever uh, been on one of those, you can appreciate this. The sign says, muddy when wet. And then someone added, dusty when dry. A sign on a fence surrounding a construction site. Please do not chat with or feed the builders. Now, okay, so listen closely. This one is on cat medicine. You know, feline kitty medicine. May cause dizziness may cause drowsiness. Alcohol could intensify this effect. Use caution when operating a car or dangerous machinery. Okay. A label on medicine sealed in the blister pack. You know those pills that you have to, they say pop through and you can't, you gotta get the scissors out. So this is a, a notice on there. Please remove tablet from blister packaging before taking. Manufacturers and Places of public put these signs on for people's stupidity and to keep them from getting sued. So as we march through the Bible on our epic journey, there's at times that we're not going to understand God's actions. And so when we get to this, the end of this message, I'm going to kind of give a disclaimer for God and for the Scriptures so that we can understand God a little bit better, or maybe try not to understand him at times. Now, for those of you that, that uh, have not been here previously, we're in this epic journey through the Bible. We're in the book of Joshua. So thus far, we've talked about Joshua's, uh, when Joshua took over for Moses, that God encouraged Joshua, be strong and courageous. And God repeated this to him several times because it was going to be a, a difficult task to lead the Israelites. And then the following week, we learned about Rahab, the, the prostitute, the harlot that hid the spies. And then the following week, we learned about the crossing of the Jordan River. That is, the Jordan River was flooded and how the Israelites got across it. and God led them through there. And so when we come to today's message, we're talking about one of these colossal epic things uh, that happened in the Bible. You know, there's the creation, there's Noah and the ark, there's uh, Israelites crossing the Red Sea, there's Jonah and the big fish, and there's 
uh, Daniel in the lion's den. So we've got these epic stories, and today is one of those epic stories, the fall of Jericho, when the walls came tumbling down. Now, according to the title, I didn't come up with that. And so this week, Nancy asked, well, hey, I came up with that title. Do I get credit? So I'm giving Nancy, our secretary, credit for the title today. So if you don't like it, blame her. So the Israelites find themselves now on the west side of the Jordan River. They crossed it while it was flooding. The, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, when their feet touched the water, God stopped the waters upstream of the Jordan River. And then the Israelites crossed on dry ground while these priests holding the Ark of the Covenant stayed in the middle of the river. And when all the army was across, the Israelite, the, the priests walked out. And when they were, as soon as they were out of the floodplain, God released the waters. And that must have been a mammoth sight to see. I just, I, 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 I love storms. I love, okay, don't, we won't go there. Anyway, I just get excited. So after they crossed the river, the first thing God told them to do, circumcise all the males. Now for the last 40 years, if you go back to Abraham, they, all the males were supposed to be circumcised. So for the last 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, they hadn't done that. So God said, get that done. And then the next thing that happened was that they celebrated the Passover feast. What you have to understand is that for the last 40 years, the Israelites had been eating manna, this wafer-like thing. How many ways can you make manna? How many ways or you know can you cook it how many ways can you fix bread how many ways could you fix pancakes use your imagination you don't have to go very far because there's probably not very many ways so you can imagine that when they celebrated the passover feast it probably really tasted good and would have been quite a banquet so our reading today what we're going to start with is joshua chapter 5 now we got you up to date with everything so when the Israelites got across the Jordan River, the news spread throughout the land of Canaan, what was going on. So let's go to Joshua chapter 5, verse 1. Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they had crossed over, their hearts melted in fear and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. I just imagine this. If you're the Canaanite people, you're thinking that you're safe because the Jordan River is at flood stage. There's no way they can cross. And then your messengers come back to you and say, God got them across. And they feared greatly. Now just think about this. You, you, you felt safe. And now you've, you've heard the rumors of the last 40 some years of how God led them out of Egypt and crossing the Red Sea, and, and now they've crossed over the Jordan River during flood stage. This mighty Israelite army led by God is now in your land. I want us to think back in history of our country, back to when the time of the locust plagues. Uh, in, in the research this week, this was amazing. The biggest on record was the locust plague of 1874, and it was devastating. Our country has less than 4 million miles, square miles in it, according to what I researched. The locust plague was over 2 million square miles. That's over half the country was plagued by these locusts. Now, the locusts uh, were so thick that they would cover the sun for up to six hours because there's so many of them flying. It was devastating. Now, we would call them grasshoppers here, but they, they're called locusts. They ate the crops. So there was nothing left when they moved through. The trees, the leaves, the grass. They ate the wool off of sheep. They ate the harnesses off of the horses. They ate the paint off the wagons. And they even ate wooden pitchforks and the wooden handles of the shovels. Devastating. This, this locust plague just devastated everything. Locusts were said to have been up to a foot deep in areas, and so many that when the train locomotives tried to pull the train, there were so many locust entrails on the track that the trains would 
have a hard time getting traction. It said that the farmers could only save their drinking water. It was that devastating. Now, put yourself in the place of the Canaanite people. And you've got this massive Israelite army being led by God. And you're going to feel like the farmers of our country during these locust plagues, fearing that these Israelite, this Israelite army was going to come and annihilate everything in his path. And they would have, but we know the history. Israelites sinned, the, the army sinned, the people sinned, and so God did not let them take it through like that. But they were going to devour the land. And the first point of attack was Jericho. So let's start reading that in Joshua chapter 1, beginning with verse 6. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went in and no one came, no one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with his king and his fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. Let's pause here and look at this from Joshua's point of view. Now, we don't know what he was thinking, but let's just take a look at this. Joshua was a warrior, a soldier, a leader of soldiers, the, the general, the commander-in-chief, you might say. He had seen all these things that God had done, how God had given them the victories, but they had fought in these victories. And now God, the ultimate commander-in-chief, says, I want you to march around the city. That's it. March around the city, and I'll take down the walls for you. March around once each day for six days. On the seventh day, march around seven times. Give a loud shout, and you can go in. I wonder what Joshua thought about that. He's a soldier. He's a fighting man. He's ready to fight. Just let's go back in history. World War II. George Patton. What would it be like, those of you that know about the history of George Patton, if God had told George Patton, okay, I want you to march up to Germany. Don't fire a shot. Let the tanks and the cannons behind. Let the bombers behind. I'll give you the battle. Now, if you know anything about Patton, I think he would have a little bit of trouble with that. I'm not even certain Eisenhower would have had a good time with that because these are, these are fighting men. These are men that know their art of battle. They've been trained. So what would Joshua's first reaction have been to God's plan? On the other hand, how was Joshua going to get beyond those walls anyway? I mean, think about it. In those days, the only way that you could get in a walled city like that was to lay siege to it. And it was going to take months, if not years, until you finally starved them out or they had no more water or whatever. And so Joshua had just witnessed the crossing of the Jordan River in flood stage. So did he question God? Did he believe God? Would he even take this plan to his army? Well, we go to verse 6. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priest and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army, Advance! March around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priest who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time, the trumpets were sounding. But Joshua had commanded the army, Do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then shout! So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling at once. Then the army returned to camp and spent the night there. And so from this, we get that God demands obedience despite 
seeming trivial. God demands obedience despite maybe his command sounding trivial. I wonder what the army was thinking at this. Have we talked about what Joshua may be thinking? What was the army thinking about this order? What went through the soldiers' minds as they were marching around the city? Did they think it was a good idea? Did they not think it's a good idea? The, the only sound was of the trumpets blowing. They were not, the people were not to shout. They were not to talk. They were not to say a word. They were to march around the city in complete silence. Why? Oh, we don't know why. God didn't give us the answer. But I, I wonder, you know, in every crowd there's a pessimist. And in every crowd there's usually more than one pessimist. And I wonder... Did God tell them not to speak because if you got a pessimist marching beside, marching beside you, would the pessimist start to say, hey, Charlie, this is stupid. And Charlie might say, yeah, it really is stupid. And you know how pessimism can spread like a plague? So I don't know why God would have said march in silence, but it had a great effect. Don't say a word. Don't take up your arms. Do nothing. And so from the army's perspective, I have to wonder if this seemed a little humiliating. Just march and be quiet. No attack. No words. But they obeyed. That's the thing. That's the important thing. It may have seemed silly. It may have seemed a trivial thing. But the army obeyed. Verse 12. Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them, and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except on that day they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, Shout! For the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. Seven times, marching around the city. And at the end of that seventh time with the horns of the trumpets blowing, the people shouted, and I know I'm getting ahead of myself on what we read, but the walls came tumbling down. Joshua and the army fought the Battle of Jericho. Now, if you remember the old song, I don't know if they still sing it nowadays or not, but Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho. We sang it as kids, and Joshua did fight the Battle of Jericho. But it was God who brought the walls down. Joshua commanded the army, go ahead and rout everything, but stay away from the people's idols. Those pagan idols, don't touch them, stay away from them, leave them be. If you know the history of Israel, what was it that kept dooming them? What was it that kept leading them away from God, the Lord God? It was the pagan worship. And time after time, we're going to read in the Old Testament as we go through it, how the people strayed from God, led away because of pagan worship and those blasted idols. But save the silver and the gold and the articles of bronze and iron and place it in the Lord's treasure. And next week, we'll learn what happened there. Go to verse 20. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with a sword every living thing in it, men and women, 
young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. When I was a kid in Sunday school, I loved this story. And many of you probably remember that too. Vacation Bible school, anytime we got to the story, I loved it. The victory that God had over the evil Canaanite people of the city of Jericho. And I can still feel that excitement of the story and God's victory. Yes, the song says Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, but it was God's victory. It was God's doing. They could not have done it without God, so the victory belonged to God. The victory belongs to God. The highlight of my week is Sunday mornings. I love Sunday mornings. Now, I don't like Wednesdays and Thursday mornings because that's sermon prep, and I, have, I struggle with that. But Sunday morning, I love because I get up, and even when I, when I don't preach on a Sunday morning, I'm glad that I get the week off, but I'm sitting there listening to somebody else preach, and it's like I'm thinking about, well, if that was me up there preaching, or I'm getting ideas from them. So I love Sunday mornings. And occasionally I get people going out and they say, well, thank you, I, I, I like what you, what you said, or uh, the p- message touched them. And it would be easy for me to get a big head. Now, maybe 30, 40 years ago I would have, but I don't, because I know that the victory is God's. And that as long as I'm obeying God and doing what God wants, and if I get a compliment on that, the victory is God's. Now, if somebody doesn't like it because of something I said wrong or because I flubbed it, or even if I I think I did okay and nobody says anything, well, then that's on me. See, I give God the victory, I give him the, the credit for the victory, and I'll take the blame if something goes wrong. And that's perspective that we need to have because God always does an excellent job. We don't always do an excellent job. So the victory belongs to God. Joshua did not win the battle of Jericho. The victory belonged to God. So now let's let's put these two points together. God demands our obedience despite seeming trivial or silly. And then we add the last point, the victory belongs to God. Now, how many times does God tell us to do things that we think are silly, that we think are trivial? Uh, God may say uh, we're to do something in his commands. And we think, that is so silly, I don't want to do that. It doesn't make sense to us, but it doesn't matter because if God tells us to do it. Maybe God tells us, don't do something, because it's a sin. And we think, oh, it's so trivial, God. I'll I'll, I'll take this in my own hands. And uh, it doesn't make sense to us. But to God, it does. Maybe God tells you to wait. Oh, patience. None of us like patience. Many people refuse to pray for patience. It doesn't make sense. What do, you, what do you mean, God? Why wait? I want to go. It doesn't make sense sometimes. Maybe sometimes God says go. Now, to me, this is the hardest one because oftentimes when God says go, I say, I'm not ready. And so sometimes we just stand there, sit there, lay there, and we don't do what God wants us to do. We consider God's command too trivial, too silly. Is it any more silly than marching around a city six times, one each day for six days, and then seven times on the seventh day? That's silly. But what we have to notice is God did not give them the victory until they finished every last part of that silly command. God did not take the wall down after they'd been around the city ten times. That would be six days plus four times on day seven. God didn't take it down on the the twelfth time they went around the city. No, one time for six days, seven times on day seven, 13 times, and God didn't even take the wall down after they completed it the seventh time. God didn't take the wall down until they 
finished and completed every trivial aspect of the wall, uh, of the uh, army's uh, command, to circle it seven, uh, th seven times on that last day, and then trumpets sound, everybody shouts. Now all the trivial things are done, and God brought the wall down. God gives us victory when we complete all the trivial things. The victory is not ours, it's God's. We have to be compliant to what God tells us to do. Sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers the way that we want. And I have to wonder, is it because we've considered part of his commands trivial? Oh, that's silly, God. Yeah, we complete most of them, but yet there's just this one area that, well, that's trivial. Now, I'm not saying that every time that God doesn't answer our prayer the way that we want it, that it's because we're sinning. That God's ways are higher than our ways. But I wonder how many times we pray to God and God says, are you listening to my commands? Are you following every one of my commands? Are you really doing what I told you to do? Well, no, God, I, I want to do that in my way. No. God expects us to obey every command, even if we think it's silly or trivial. And when God gives the victory, remember, the victory is not ours. The victory is God's. So we give God the glory for the victory. We give God the glory for the victory. Sure, you did your part, but without God working, would you really get the victory? I know, we, we know of sinful people that have some really great victories, but sooner or later, their world's going to fall apart. It might be on Jesus' second coming. Sooner or later, they will pay for not following God. Ours is the victory when we follow God obediently and go through whatever he says that we will go through. So give God the glory for the victory. And if we obey him and he gives that victory that we're a part of, give him the glory. Now, we open this message talking about disclaimers, and I have a disclaimer this morning for this day and age that I would have never, never thought about giving years and years ago. I want to read Joshua chapter 6, verse 21 again. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with a sword every living thing in it. Men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Now, when I was a kid, we would have never questioned that. God's sovereign. He said, kill everybody, even the babies, even the women, even the livestock. Every living thing in the city of Jericho was to be killed. We didn't think anything about that 50 years ago. Today, that's major in today's society. How could God order that to happen? How could God order the Israelite army to kill everybody and everything? Such innocent people, innocent babies. I'm not, I don't have an answer. I, I, I'm not saying I understand that. All we can do is try to reason some logic. I mean, what, what might be some answers to this? Well, let's go back to Noah's day. God told Noah, build the ark. And all the time that Noah built that ark, for decades and decades and decades, Noah preached. Not one convert. Not one. And his audience would have come to him. His, uh, the, the people that he could preach to came to see this idiot, this wacko, building a big boat in the middle of nowhere. Not one convert. So you want to question God? He gave everybody a chance there. God knows who will come to him and who won't. When we look at the land of Canaan, we look at the inhabitants of Canaan. They're evil. They kept leading the Israelites away from God. 
So God knew the hearts of the people. And the only ones that he saved was Rahab and her family, whoever was in that house with her. God cannot tolerate people who worship foreign gods or pagan worship. So all we can say is that God knew what he was doing when he said destroy all the inhabitants and all the livestock and every living thing in Jericho. I don't always agree with God. As a preacher, I don't like what he says sometimes. I don't like what he does at times. But he is sovereign. He knows and he understands whether we do or not. So getting back to our main idea here, are we obedient to God in the trivial things? And the things that seem mighty silly. Do you consider his commands as trivial? While we may not agree with him, we still have to obey him. Stay faithfully tuned to God. Love God. And give him credit for the victory. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're, we, are, we are finite. We are created by you, and we live in sin. We're not going to understand you. We don't get it. Our ways do not follow your ways. And of course, your ways are not our ways because we're sinful. Help us to understand, Father, that even the trivial things in life are important. They're not trivial to you. If you command them, they're major. We're the ones that categorize them. So, Father, help us to, to repent. Help us to, to look at you as God, capital G, God. It's not for us to change what you say is not for us to decide, well, do we want to follow or not? Well, I guess you've given us that opportunity, but we're to obey, and you expect us to obey. So, Father, help us to, to follow you obediently. Help us to love you. We're not always going to understand you, but we're to stay faithful to you. It's part of life. And Father, if we're outside of Christ, may we repent of our sins. May we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Your Son, you sent to die on the cross, who willingly came to suffer and die for us. Help us to repent and be baptized and for the forgiveness of sins, to receive the, your gift of the Holy Spirit. Fill us, Father, with your Spirit. For even we who are Christians find it difficult to follow you and obey you. So help us to use this story, this illustration of Joshua and the army defeat over the Canaanite people of Jericho to realize little things do matter and we can have victory in you and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you.